I just got word today that longtime broadcaster and good acquaintance of mine, Ed Walker, had died. When I was starting in radio in Indiana in the 60s, I would hear Ed on national programs. Then when I moved to Washington, D.C., he was everywhere. For years, he and Willard Scott were partners on radio, and Ed went on to become one of D.C.'s best-known radio and TV hosts, even though he was born blind. I'd like to play an interview filed some time ago on YouTube, but in two pieces. Here it is in one piece, a conversation with Ed Walker about our favorite mutual topic, old-time radio. I mentioned to Ed that unlike television and radio, they had to add a lot of extra dialogue so you understood what was going on. And you notice how they write on, on radio, guys talking on the telephone to a somebody and all of a sudden he stops and he says wait a minute you and then the gun goes off and he shoots him i mean uh, they they telegraphed everything like on the dragnet here are the stairs here's the elevator i mean you could en- envision that with good sound effects but they didn't leave anything the chance they wrote in a special way and the actors were specially trained i guess to to be consummate actors for radio i don't know how good they'd be on the stage but they can sure read a script. And of course, Ed, we have Jack Webb to thank for so many things, but some of those people who did yeoman's work in radio, uh, for example, Jack Crucian, Virginia Gregg, people such as that, we wouldn't know what they looked like had Webb not put them in Dragnet. He brought all his old radio friends into the Dragnet show on television. Right. And when Webb was criticized by NBC, which wanted him to use more familiar faces, he said when a policeman knocks on a door, Tab Hunter is not necessarily going to be on the other side of that door. (laughs) So it's great fun to watch those old Dragnet TV episodes and say, oh, look, there's John Daner or Parley Bear both of whom would, of course, be in a lot of other shows later, but these were, by and large, familiar voices who were not familiar faces. Yeah. So we really owe a debt to Jack Webb. That's right. Well, uh, Harry Morgan, who was a Friday's partner in the later edition of uh, Dragnet, was on radio with Jack Webb in the early years, and Webb was very loyal to his actors. The actors he liked, he used over and over again, whether they be on radio or television, and that, that paid off for him. And many of those actors who now may have unfamiliar names, Forrest Lewis, Herb Vigran, people such as that, they were called on a lot. Yep. And I think one of the remarkable things about these radio actors was their stamina. I mean, today a show will do 12 episodes a year on television. They did 39 fresh shows a year, one a week, live every week. And in my listening to thousands of hours of network radio, I have seldom heard anybody who was a no-show, or I guess I've seldom not heard someone not show up. Is that what I meant to say? Yeah. If it did, they'd get a substitute, uh, unless it was, and they wouldn't even mention that unless it was the headliner. Uh, I've heard on the Lux Radio Theater, filling in for so-and-so is, you know, and I can't remember the names, but uh, a lot of those journeyman actors like uh, John Daner and uh, Harry Bartell, those guys that were on Gunsmoke every week. Norman MacDonald had his own stable of actors. And if you listen to that show regularly, you'd hear the same guys in different roles every week. Well, John Daner was one of my favorite actors. He could play a minister or a senator one week and the next week be the nastiest, most ill-educated person in the world. Yep. And as we listen to those recordings today, in hindsight, it's really interesting how a very small group of actors really were on the air every week, but sometimes playing radically different characters right. and often playing incredibly different types. And the thing about the Gunsmoke, I'm on the subject, they let some of the actors be writers. Uh, some shows were written by Vic Perrin, and some shows were written by the sound man, Ray Kemper. Uh, I know he had the name credit on a couple of them. And Norman MacDonald was good enough to let them do the shows, uh, to write the shows. As a matter of fact, he wrote several himself. Of course, the main writer on that uh, series was John Meston. And what a debt we owe to him. Who was a fabulous writer. One of the most remarkable things about Gunsmoke, and, and the great late Harry Bartell told me one time, is that the guys and gals who did that weekly radio show did it with very, very little rehearsal. Oh, yeah. They had a table read on Saturday. They called it Dirty Saturdays. When they get, uh, they'd sit around, have coffee in Danish, and do the read-throughs, and 
somebody would come up with an obscene or suggestive story and then we'd go from there and uh, they would record one show then break for lunch and come back and do another one half the time and of course Gunsmoke was born in the era right after World War II Ed and we knew about magnetic recording then and that meant that this was among the first major radio shows primetime radio shows that were not done live true I know that uh, the sound men on the show have you read that book on Gunsmoke on their own, they took a Saturday, took a tape recorder, and went to uh, William Conrad's home. I guess he lived in the valley someplace. And they went out in the fields and recorded various guns and put them on what they had in those days called the McKenzie machine. In order to selectively fire them off. You could punch it up and get Matt's gun, Chester's gun, something like that. Because the guns that they were using with the blanks would overload the sound system, and they didn't sound like real guns on the air. You know, Ed, it was not that long ago that we lost one of the driving forces in network radio, and that was Norman Corwin. Uh, he was 101, but still it was a great loss. Yeah. Well, I feel very fortunate because I first met Norman in 1967 when he was guest lecturing at Indiana University. He went into a studio with a microphone, put us in another room where we could not see him, but only hear what was happening. He went in, fired off some gunshots, and then had us come in and try to find the gun, and we couldn't. There was nothing in the room we figured could make a gunshot. Then he took off his belt, his leather belt, and thwacked it on a couch, and over the mic, that sounded like a gun. To simulate the sound. And no matter how funny it may look in the studio, the question is, does it sound right at home? Well, it's gotten better. I remember if you hear one of the early Lone Ranger shows from... 1938 or something, when uh, Grazer was the uh, Lone Ranger, before he died in an automobile accident, the announcer was Brace Beamer, who later became the Lone Ranger. Anyway, when you hear the beginning of the show, they have gunshots, it sounded like a guy hitting a cereal box with a drumstick. Yeah, I remember it was pretty darn hollow. It almost sounded like tom-toms. <laughs> so they didn't have any guns at all then either, but and it it was pale in the in significance to what it sounded like when they had recorded gunshots. And of course, with the advent of magnetic tape recording, where as you say they could go out and record real guns in proper fidelity, it allowed them to do something else, and that was to faithfully reproduce the sound of the ricochet, which they could not do when faking a gunshot. Sometimes that was pretty important to the plot. Yeah. And you know, the golden days of radio, the golden age, and Corwin always said that it was the shortest golden age in history. He's right. Included a great amount of radio that came out of Chicago. Now, we think of New York and Los Angeles as centers of radio, theater, drama, and news. But uh, until the modern era, Chicago was a genuine hub. Yeah, the reason was, of course, they couldn't. Uh, transmit from the Atlantic coast to the Pacific coast at that time, and Chicago was kind of a center. And uh, as they were able to uh, get the network to go from uh, New York to L.A., then a lot of the shows moved to Los Angeles, Lum and Abner and Fibber and Molly, and a lot of those shows, and those people later became movie stars after a fashion. And uh, so that's why Chicago was a very important center for radio back in the 30s, mainly. Ed, let's change gears here for just a moment, change directions. There's one great comedian, wasn't based in Chicago, was on the East Coast, whom a lot of historians say really never got his due. Jack Benny said he was much funnier than Benny was, and that is it's kind of a sad story. That's Fred Allen. Oh, yeah. Of course, Fred Allen always sounded as if he was holding his nose. As a matter of fact, that's the way Benny used to imitate him during that fake feud they had. That's right. Ed Walker, if you would then, put Fred Allen, his style, his radio shows over the year, put, put that unsung hero into perspective. Well, he was ahead of his time, unfortunately. Uh, he was, you know, some people would refer to him as erudite, I guess. I mean, he didn't just... Uh, uh, he wasn't like uh, a comedian who just one joke after another. Uh, Alan was uh, above that sort of thing. He did a lot of good stuff. In one of his books, the Treadmill to Oblivion, I think, he was very ill toward the end of his life. And he said something. He said, I live every day as though it were my last. And one day I'll be right. How about that? And Jack Benny loved him, even though they had that fake feud going on. Benny had a great cast, too. Uh, Phil Harris was great. Dennis Day was fabulous, and uh, they used a lot of the same actors, uh, too. 
You know, I'm named for Dennis Day. Oh, really? Well, the story in my family goes that when my mother was pregnant with me right after World War II, her favorite radio show was the Jack Benny show. <laughs> and she and my dad argued over what to name me. Well, they realized that my last name would be Daly, and my mom loved Dennis Day. So they said, if he's a boy, we'll call him Dennis in honor of Dennis Day. And had I turned out to be a girl, I would have been named Doris in honor of Doris Day. Doris Daly. <laughs> you know how Dennis Day got the job as singer on that show, don't you? Refresh my memory. Which story have you heard? They wanted to hire Johnny Johnston, who had a hit record of Laura back in the 40s. And uh, they had a cast call or rehearsal or something. And... Uh, it was Dennis Day's turn to, to perform, and they said, Dennis Day, and he said, yes, please. And I'm sure he did that with that, that boyish, impish kind of, of voice. I, I guess in, in doing that, he stood out all of a sudden. And that tickled Mary, and she talked Benny into hiring Dennis as opposed to Johnny Johnston. Well, the thing about Dennis Day, my namesake, or it's the other way around, who I think had nine children or something in real life, Oh, he did, yeah. The thing about Dennis Day, Patrick McNulty, is that he began on the show as such a nebbish. They had Verna Felden play his mother. But they suddenly realized what a multifaceted guy this was. A, a singer who was a comedian who also could do a spot-on imitation of Churchill. There's a Benny show, I don't know if you've heard it, where they, you know, Benny did a lot with Ronald Coleman. Supposedly they were neighbors. And Dennis Day did a great Coleman. And they were doing... Coleman and Day back and forth, and it was fabulous. I don't know what day that, what uh, year that show was, but if you ever get a chance to hear it, you should listen to it. My Lord, Coleman had such a great voice. Yeah. And and when they pretended that Ronald Coleman and his wife were Benny's next door neighbors, her name was Benita. If you remember, Jack always called her Benita. Yeah. <laughs> and even though bringing Coleman and his wife onto one of the shows as Benny's neighbors might have originally been a one-shot idea. The idea of this incredibly straight-laced actor who did all these wonderful parts, and it's a far, far better thing I do than I have ever done, you know, th that type of thing. They so clicked with the audience that the writers had to bring them back repeatedly. Yeah, and, and they developed their own show as a result of that, the Halls of Ivy, which starred Ronald and Benita Coleman, and uh, was created by the same guy who created Fibber McGee and Molly. Good old multi-talented Donald Quinn. Donald Quinn. And some of what Quinn did is magnificent. I mean, there was such a wealth of good writing in old-time radio, but that's the way it had to be. You didn't have visuals. You had to rely strictly on the spoken word. Absolutely. And uh, I wish that uh, that kind of talent existed today. I wish people had the vehicle to uh, do old-time radio. I don't think it would go over anymore. I mean, they try to do it in the stereo. They tried that on National Public Radio for a while. And they called it Earplay, I believe was the name of the show. And uh, uh, it just never, it, it didn't have the bizzazz of the old radio show. Maybe, maybe it was past its time. I don't know. But I, all I know is I love the radio. And uh, that's why I decided to go into it. And we have a lot of other things we want to talk about. I had mentioned at the beginning of this show that you were born blind, but that has not stood in your way to becoming one of the best-loved radio personalities on the East Coast. I remember in an earlier interview, though, you telling me that as a young guy, you were in on a test of the the widely used cane now that blind people use, but you were among the first to get to use it. Yeah, it was after the war. We had a teacher at school who uh, was the phys ed teacher, and he went into the Army. He later became an eye doctor. Dick Hoover was his name. And he came back to the school and talked to the superintendent and said, you know, I've had a lot of success with blinded war veterans up at Valley Forge teaching these guys how to use a long cane. Heretofore, the canes were just symbolic. They were white to signify that you couldn't see. So he developed this system with a long cane, and he came back and said, if I could test it with some of your older kids, I'd like to do it. And he said, yeah, sure. And this guy was amazing. He would lie down in the street, uh, not, an, uh, not a busy street. He'd dare you to hit him with your cane and not step on him. <laughs> and then if you ever walked off a curb, 
he'd say, supposing that had been a 10-foot cliff, Doc. And I said, well, that makes you wonder a little bit. But he was, he was tough, but he was good. And he, as I say, later became an eye surgeon. And we have the, the long cane technique uh, attributed to Dick Hoover. So initially, the, the canes that blind people used that had painted to signify that they couldn't see didn't really serve any purpose. They, they were just kind of a sign they were carrying. That's right. Now they have uh, canes that uh, vary in length. And I think they say that the cane, when it's standing vertical, should come up to your breastbone. That's the, the signal that they use for the, the length of the cane. And you make an arc with it as you walk. As your left foot goes forward, the cane is in front of your right foot. And as your right foot goes forward, the cane is in front of your left foot, getting ready for the next step. And Ed, I think from talking to you in the past, you had wonderful parents who put up with your youthful enthusiasm. You told me a story once about how your dad gave you a degree of freedom but looked out for you. It's a wonderful story. Can you recount it for us? I was in high school. Right there again, I just had that course with Dick Hoover in the cane system, and I had a girlfriend who lived on the other side of town in northeast Washington. And I, at breakfast one day, told my parents, well, I'm going over and see Dottie today. And my mother said, oh, no, no, son, you can't do that. And my dad just said, let him go. And I said, thanks, Pop. So what I did not know until years later, my father followed me, let me get lost, make mistakes. He never offered to help me. He just wanted to be sure I didn't get hurt. But I thought that was uh, a really great thing for a father to do for a son. But your dad realized that he and your mother were going to have to let you out of the nest eventually. That's right. And the other thing he did, when we moved, when I was in college, we moved to a new house. What wasn't new. I mean, new to us. And they had a retaining wall in front. And one night, my father found this boulder and put it in the corner of that retaining wall. He said, here's that, that rock, son. Now, remember this. If you ever get off the wrong street or something, this could be your symbol to find out that you're at the right house. And sure enough, one night, a cab driver let me off in the wrong block, and I was lost. And I turned around, listened, listened for the direction of the traffic on Wisconsin Avenue. And I started walking back up, and it was a block later. I found that stone in the corner of that retaining wall, and I found my way home. Wow. Yeah. Now, Ed, you and I share a great love of radio. We, we wouldn't be talking to each other right now. I wouldn't be doing this show if I didn't love radio. And I think both of us developed a love of it by listening to those 50,000-watt long-distance stations at night from rural Indiana. I could pick up KDKA in Pittsburgh. Oh, yeah. And many of those Clear Channel, now, not the company we talk about today that's Clear Channel, but they were called Clear Channel stations. Many of those stations could be heard over much of the U.S. Yeah. So in my case, I went away to college and had a mixed-up career over the years. But in your case, here you are, a young guy, fascinated with radio, but you're walking around with a cane because you're blind. I would assume it took a lot of work to get anybody at a radio station or even in school to believe that you could be a success with what they considered to be a handicap. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Nobody wanted to do that. And they used to laugh at me at school. Yeah, sure, kid. You ain't kid. You know, you know. And then when I went to American University, that's where I met Willard Scott uh, my freshman year there. And we hit it off very well. And uh, we had a little campus radio station. And uh, one of the guys there said, was a friend of Willard's too, he said, go in that studio. We have one of these Velocity microphones live on both sides. And he said, sit across the table and say something smart to Eddie and see what he does. He can't see anyway. So he did. And I retorted. And he retorted. And the the joy boys were born <laughs> and uh you know you don't just assign somebody to be your partner you have to have a certain what's the word i want there has to be a chemistry there has to be a certain kind of rapport there well yeah a certain rapport yeah it is and i have always heard that if a, a, a pair works together laurel and hardy Evan costello whatever they begin to anticipate what the other is going to say and the comedy sometimes becomes automatic exactly i could anticipate what willard was going to say and vice versa and uh, so that's that's how, and then uh, we got a job at WOL, which was a 250-watt station then, on Sunday nights. And the program was called Going AWOL, and uh, we did that 
five dollars a show you guys finally hit big money at least now you had enough cash to pay your bus fare <laughs> yeah. this was in 1952 and uh, uh willard of course was a staff announcer but they had me come in and do that that show on sunday night and that was the first experience i had for meager salary as it was but the least they got on the air and uh, that's how it all began uh then when he moved over to nbc and went into the navy knew the draft was catching up with him uh, we had started the joy boys over there at wrc and then willard enlisted in the navy and i auditioned and got his afternoon record show which started out as a 15-minute program at quarter of six and at that at that time the soap operas were going off the air you know, right and left. The show that was 15 minutes when Willard had it ended up to be four hours by the time he came back from the Navy. And I hope I'm correct in this. Because you were working at a major market radio station, you didn't have to handle all the complex equipment. No, but I have done that. Which pretty much goes to show that you can do anything you put your mind to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, that was the beginning time of your long partnership with Willard Scott you were known all over the East Coast as the Joy Boys. How did that partnership first begin to blossom then on radio? Let's see. We were on from 4 to 6. And shortly after that, Willard got assigned to do television, the Bozo the Clown Show. So we would just do a half hour of the Joy Boys. Then Willard would go up and do his television. And I had to do the rest of the show myself. And our show has been on various times of the day. For a while, we were on at 7.05 at night. We would tape it. And then they moved us in the evening from uh, 8 to 11, I think it was, 8 to 11. And I thought that was kind of an insult because everybody was watching television by that time. And Willard, the smart man that he is, said, uh, look at it this way. By the time we go on the air, they can't half hear the st signal of the station at night. And most of the management people are drunk anyway by that time. <laughs> so, And we got all day to do freelance work, which accounted for a lot of the commercials that we did back in the 60s. So it was a blessing in disguise. Now, Ed, my first memories of putting a name with your voice was not during the many, many times I visited D.C., nor during the 20 years I lived there. It was earlier. I'm doing local radio as a kid in Indiana, and we ran what's called a public affairs show. You just ran it to fill time on weekend. You were the anchor for it. It was for a group even back then that was trying to get people to recycle. It was called Waste Not, Want Not. Oh, yes, I used to do that show. And if I'm not mistaken, one of the people you had on the show had this great mafia-sounding name, Rocco Patron. I don't remember that name. And I remember it came in on little reels of tape, and we ran it every weekend, Waste Not, Want Not, and that was the first time I heard your voice and knew your name. Well, and that's very interesting. Uh, we was the kid about that show, and I said, we're going to change the title, call it Let's Talk Trash. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Nobody bought that. So, But this show was heard middle of the night on Saturday and a Sunday morning, and I didn't know anybody ever heard it. But for some reason, we ran it on Saturday afternoon. So see, some people did hear it. It was a five-minute show, and uh, it was, uh, you know, they had a, a producer and everything like that. And I must admit, I couldn't read it straight through without tape editing that's one thing when you do, when you use print you read ahead of yourself so that you can anticipate what's coming in braille you don't have that luxury so i had to read everything over a couple of times and even then uh, i would have to do a lot of retakes but they were very patient with me on that oh i i thought it was a great little show i look forward to hearing it every week you know there were so many of those public affairs shows i remember one cbs did called the world of religion douglas edward anchored it live every I think Thursday afternoon, and I was at CBS in New York one time, and I was introduced to this woman named Isabel Lape. If it had been Ann Smith, I never would have remembered the name, but Isabel Lape, whose name I had heard in the credit, she produced The World of Religion. I said, hey, I'm from Indiana, we air your show, and she said, too bad nobody gets to hear it. I said, no, we, we air it Saturday afternoons at 4.30. I thought she was going to drop dead. We must have been the only station in America that actually aired all these wonderful shows when people were awake. But, you know, living in Washington was an ideal place to be as an announcer because there were tons of government and military public affairs shows coming out of there every... Yeah, with guest star, stars for defense, 
Uh, the Red Cross had spa shows. Serenade in Blue. Serenade in Blue. And getting back to the Joy Boys, you and Willard both did funny voices and accents. You did the majority of them. And there was one character from Baltimore. And if no one listening has heard a Baltimore accent, you got to hear this. You called him Baltimore Benny. Well, in Baltimore, of course, I'm having gone to school over there. They have a certain way of talking. And he talked like this, pal. How's everything? He let us say everything, everything. And uh, I remember one time I was in Baltimore, uh, and I, I had a little thing, a mitt that I wore on my hand, and one side of it said bus, and you turn it over, and the other side said taxi. And you'd hold this thing up in the air if you had the right side, and a taxi would pull up eventually, and the guy pulls up one time. First time I used it, I had it in my hand about 30 seconds. Cab driver pulls up, opens the door. He says, where the hell, how the hell did you, where's that thing? Where'd you get that thing? And I said, well, I told him what. Hop in, man. I never seen anything like that in my whole life. And it, it's ironic that the main sound they mispronounce is the, the, the sound O. Oh. They say O. Oh. And, of course, the Oreos, the O's, that's the ball team there. So they're using that a lot. Yeah, the O's, the Oreos, A. Hey. And uh, if you listen to the national anthem at an Orioles game, uh, maybe you've heard it. Oh, say, when they get to the line, oh, say, does that Star Spangled Banner, they all go, oh, you know. <laughs> they <laughs> and, and they leave letters out. Now, in Baltimore, the word payment, P-A-Y-M-E-N-T, payment, is not something you put in the mail to a creditor. Oh, yeah. That's the, the, the street. That's what you walk on, a payment. And Santa Claus, can, Santa Claus comes down the chimney. And, and there's a park there named for the Druids, but they can't say Druid properly. Druid Hill Park. Druidal. Druidal Park. And you go to the ocean. You don't go down to the ocean. You go down the ocean. You're going to Ocean City. On this edition of American Montage, we're talking about a lot of things with Ed Walker, a veteran East Coast radio and TV personality born blind who conquered his handicap and went on to an incredible career, including working for decades with Willard Scott on radio. He and Willard were the Joy Boys. And I ask Ed if they did their daily show, multi-hour program, much as Bob and Ray did, by pretty much making it up as they went along. Well, that's what we did. We, didn't, we, we couldn't write that kind of material every day. Now, we had our little soap opera that we did for a while, As the Worm Turns, and Willard would write down names and the, the plot. He would read the, you know, this week in Big City Hospital, Dr. So-and-so and so-and-so. And the first episode of As the Worm Turns involved the doctor who he made out to be a complete idiot. And uh, the doctor was not Dr. Kaleo. We got that name because Willard saw a sign in a road in Virginia for a town called Calio. And so he just paraphrased it and said, Dr. Kaleo. And he was kind of a nudnik. And uh, after the first episode, we get a call from NBC legal department. You got to knock that off. Change that doctor's name. His lawyer just called us. Wow. So, so there was a real Dr. Kaleo somewhere? This is true. He called a. He says, uh, we, uh, we have to ask you to take that doctor's name off the show. You're prejudicing our case. I said, what case? He says, Dr. Kaleo's up on a malpractice charge. That kind of squashed the use of that character from episode one, didn't it? And there's more to it. About five years later, I've left WRC. I'm now at WMAL. We had an intern there, a young girl, and I can't think of her name. She says to me one day, Mr. Walker, my mother said to tell you hello. I said, well, I don't believe I know your mother. She said, well, she knows you. She was Dr. Kaleo's secretary. Ed, one interesting aspect of your career. First of all, you had enormous success in radio, even though you're, you're blind, is that you did television. I remember watching you on TV in D.C., and you're standing there looking right at the camera, supposedly looking right at the camera, and in, in your left hand is a clipboard, and you're reading Braille. I mean, it was the damnedest thing I've ever seen, but it worked. Well, that's the station at first wouldn't show that clipboard. They would not show my hands. And, of course, I got directions by wearing an earpiece, you know, interrupted feedback thing, and the director up in the control room would tell me which camera to look at. And that's how I did it. It was actually easier than radio because I didn't have to figure the times or anything like that. And if I had to talk up a, a piece of film, they'd count down, get down to five, four, three, two, 
one hope that I got there in time, and then they'd roll the audio, you know. Well, it sounds complicated, but as you say, it worked. And uh, that was very good. And then the station ultimately decided that was okay. Somebody called up the station one time and said, I had a question. A guy that does that television show in the morning, is he blind? And they said, yes, he is. And they said, well, I just wanted to know. I just was curious. I saw his hand reading Braille, and I just wondered. So they accepted it. It was, uh, you know, it wasn't a big deal. Actually, what would have been funny is if the station would have told callers, no, Mr. Walker is not blind. He just likes to read books in Braille while he's on the air. Yeah. <laughs> and let's talk yeah. about something near and dear to our hearts here, and that's the preservation of old-time radio. Now, there are those experts in film who say that less than half of the movies ever made still have a decent copy Many from the silent era simply fell apart from that old nitrate film. There's not that much old-time radio still around. It's ironic that when all of that was being done live in the 20s and 30s and most of the 40s, they didn't think it was important to record. Of course, they didn't care much for the quality of recording. You would actually make a record. You would record a disc on a big bulky machine called a lathe cutter. But some of those shows, the only reason we have any copies of them at all is that the sponsors wanted a copy just to make sure the commercials went okay. Well, that's probably true. And Vic and Sade was another show. And thank God that Fibber McGee and Molly had that long association with Johnson's Wax. Johnson's Wax made a recording of every Fibber McGee and Molly show. They were almost thrown out. Some young person at the uh, headquarters didn't realize who Fibber McGee and Molly were, but the only reason we have all of that wonderful wealth of Fibber McGee and Molly is because of the archivist that Johnson's Wax. Yeah, and that's what happened to Vic and Say. The sponsor wanted air checks as Procter & Gamble, and they were cleaning out their files one day, so we don't need all these big discs, and they got rid of them. So they're hard to come by. Uh, some of them are being saved now, because of Armed Forces Radio Service. Can you explain for those listening who do not know how important Armed Forces Radio was to preserving old-time radio shows, can you explain how that happened and how we really owe them a debt? Well, Armed Forces Radio Service would had the right to take shows off the network, cut out the commercials, and put in public service announcements that were played to the servicemen and women overseas, you know, so they didn't have commercials, but they had the the rest of the show was taken right off the air. And uh, they were supposed to have been destroyed, but you know how people are in this business. They saved them. And so uh, some of these shows are showing up from Armed Forces discs, and uh, that's good. Now the collectors are digitizing them, which is helping a lot. Uh, they used to have them on tape, and you know how tapes get noisy after a while. But now with the digital, they, they just can digitize everything. And uh, so that really helps the fidelity. And there are a lot of things online. You can see uh, different places that sell old time. There's one called Radio Archives. There's another one that supplies me with show shows. And uh, we give him a credit every week. It's called Old Time Radio on MP3.com. And, you know, MP3, which is a type of compression of audio files, is amazing. I got a disc through the mail one time that had, I think, 60 hours, maybe not quite that many, but 60 hours of old-time radio. Can you imagine that would have been 30 cassettes? And back in the, the days of, of disc, I mean, MP3 has opened up a huge opportunity to cram a lot of audio, particularly old-time radio, which doesn't have a lot of fidelity, to cram a lot of audio into a small space. And depending upon the bit rate that they use, they don't sound half bad in MP3, no. Now, Ed, on your radio show, which has run for decades in Washington, D.C., on the preeminent public radio station there in Washington, you do a weekend show that is a real play-it-again when it comes to old-time radio. I know you have a chance to sample the demographics. Is it mostly old guys like me who are listening to OTR, old-time radio, or is it a pretty good cross-section? A lot of kids listen, and uh, we are, not that there are too many people listening to the radio on Sunday, and most people are watching 60 Minutes, but we are the number one uh, show on radio, people listening to the radio at that time, which uh, we've been doing that for a long time, and uh, people just seem to like it. It's a 
It's appointment listening, as they say at the station. You, it wouldn't go over every night, but at the end of the week, as I say at the beginning of every show, forget about the problems you'll face in the week to come, and any problems you had in the last week, forget them. This is our time of day. The end of one week, the beginning of another, and for four hours, you just revel in nostalgia, and that's what they did. Ed, now, that salutation really smacks of old-time radio. Reminds me of that show called Moon River that was done out of Chicago. That That is such a wonderful, restful, optimistic way to wrap up the week. Yeah, it is. Ed, in our minutes remaining, let's talk about the wonderful wealth of announcers who worked in the Washington area. On another one of these broadcast shows, I talked to Fred Fisk, who spent 60 years in radio in Washington. Not only was it the place where locally you had such wonderful news people from uh, David Brinkley on down, local little-known people such as Bryson Rash, my childhood hero Edward P. Morgan, all of those people were there, but they had you and Willard and Fred Fisk and a ton of other people doing fun radio. And I remember listening to two guys, Harden and Weaver. Now, Frank Harden was an announcer on ABC also. He was Edward P. Morgan's announcer, and he did that memorable introduction, the 13.5 million members of the AFL-CIO who are working to keep America strong and free, bring you Edward P. Morgan and the news. That's right, AF of LCIO, yes. And his partner, Jackson Weaver, with a gorgeous baritone voice. I first knew him decades before I moved to D.C., much as I had heard you. He was the original voice of Smokey the Bear. Did you know those two guys? I knew them, yes. I, uh, uh, Jackson has unfortunately passed away, but Frank is still going strong. and He's in his 80s now. The last time I saw Frank was a Christmas party or something. I said, how you doing, Frank? He says, oh, I'm into ecology these days. I said, what do you mean? He said, this morning I took out the trash. <laughs> <laughs> I love one-liners like that. And, and most people in radio are full of them. And that was a very popular team, Harden and Weaver, who had the morning show. We never got to be on in the morning, and much to our chagrin. We were good friends with Harden and Weaver, so we were friendly competitors. And I think you and I should feel fortunate that we did radio back when it was fun, when you had a lot of people helping you. You went out and you did all kinds of exciting stuff. Now it is so cut and dried, so pared down to almost nothing. I talk to young people in radio today, and they say the only fun they have, and they, they dread coming to work most days, the only fun they have is when they go out and do a remote broadcast. Yeah, I see. I never got to do a big band remote. Now, Willard did, and I had something I missed. Uh, they used to broadcast from the Spanish ballroom at Glen Echo here, and they have big bands come there. I know Mac McGarry, a friend of mine, uh, did the Dorseys and Ray Anthony, Les Elgart. And they had Willard come and show how music changed in the 50s. McGarry had done Tommy Dorsey. The next week, the featured artist was Bill Haley and the Comets. Wow. You know, that change in radio from Glenn Miller and all the other big bands to, to rock and roll seemed to almost happen overnight. It did. And Willard had, was the announcer, couldn't even get on the stage because of the crowd. He had to go back to the station and plug in the intros to the songs. He couldn't get to the stage. Ed, I have worked in a lot of different parts of the U.S., but I wouldn't trade those 20 years I spent in Washington, D.C. for anything. I've been lucky. My whole broadcasting career, I've worked in the city, which is, again, very unusual because most guys, when you know, when they start to go to broadcasting school and you end up in Talladega, Alabama at a 250-watt station or something, and then you work your way up. But I was fortunate to get on a big station uh, right off the... Well, I had another station before that. There was a station called... Well, it's still on, WPGC. And uh, they had their studios and transmitter in Morningside, Maryland. It was a brand new station when I got there. And the owner of that station had a daughter that uh, and was mentally retarded or something. And uh, so he took pity and gave me a job, not for pay. Uh, he brought me lunch every day first. So in order to get your foot in the door, so to speak, as, as a young guy, you went way out in, in the country, in the far-flung Washington, D.C. suburbs to work for gratis, but you did get lunch. <laughs> it was a new station, didn't have any money, but I would travel all the way out to Morningside, Maryland, 
and do the show out there. And the uh, transmitter was, we had the studios in the transmitter building, and it was on a guy's farm. And I had to sign off the station, and I had to record the sign off because I couldn't get through it straight because I would say, our studios, offices, and transmitter are located on the farm of Mr. Duval B. Evans. About that time, you'd hear a rooster crow off in the distance. <laughs> Reminds me of a station I worked at in Indiana where they had horses in the background. <laughs> and I just couldn't get through it. I had to record it some night when I knew the roosters had gone to bed. <laughs> but uh, that was fun, too. That was a learning experience. They had uh, uh, no hot water in the building. The teletype machine was in the bathroom. And the guy who did the midday news would go in about 11. I'm going in to edit the news. And he knew what he was going to do. <laughs> but, Ed, because it is radio, because it is the sound of the human voice, you can really create something out of nothing. I mean, it is the theater of the mind. Yeah. And let me give a little demonstration here. And, and this was widely used in the golden days of radio. I have a big sheet of cellophane here. Very similar to what cigarette packages are wrapped in. And in the old days, they would crinkle it up, and you would add... <laughs> and then over in the corner, you would have someone who was good at making the sound of a siren, maybe with their mouth or a small siren machine, and people mulling around, making crowd noise. And, and you could do wonderful things on radio... And put out this fire. <laughs> of course, you also have the people who could paint pictures with words. Edward R. Murrow, probably foremost among them. And you mentioned a restroom earlier. It's funny that first studio they gave Murrow in, in London was apparently originally a, a, a women's restroom. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Those were good days, I mean, for radio, too. Some of the stuff that Murrow did, if you ever have a chance to hear his description of Mugenwald, which is a concentration camp. I cannot listen to that to this day or try to recite any part of it without getting out a box of Kleenex. It is that gut-wrenching, and it's all word pictures. Oh, yes. Ed Murrow was probably one of the greatest newsmen I've ever heard who didn't start out to be a radio newsman, actually. But uh, I, anybody who listens to this... And, uh, teaches or you know radio classes I would urge them to have their students listen to some of those recordings Ed speaking of Edward R. Murrow did you get to see the movie uh, Good Night and Good Luck the the story of Murrow and the McCarthy era that was I think done exceptionally well it was interesting uh, they I have it around here some I know somebody told me that a lot of people smoke cigarettes in that movie. Boy, you're not kidding. It was full of smoke-filled rooms and, and uh, people with cigarettes. And of course, Murrow was a chain smoker anyway. And it ended up killing him. Yeah, but the guy who did the part didn't even sound like Murrow, but he had the same phraseology. Whoever wrote the script knew some of Murrow's taglines that he would use. And uh, the, the movie was interesting, and I think it was edu uh, and educated some people who don't remember Murrow and person to person and those shows uh, see it now and those shows that they did in the 50s and 60s. And you know, as a kid, I never miss see it now. My parents never miss that Murrow show on Sunday night. So years later, I go to college. They're showing the classic Murrow McCarthy broadcast, and I can't figure out why I didn't see it on television. I read about it, I heard about it, I never saw it. Then I realized it was on my seventh birthday, and my dad had thrown a big surprise birthday party that night, so that's why I never saw that classic Murrow. And you missed it. But thank God for film, and I mean, now you can get all of that Murrow stuff on DVD, the classic shows he did, Harvest of Shame, about migrant farm workers, and... All those wonderful See It Now broadcasts, and even person to person, which, as you know, he didn't like doing. Back to D.C. for a moment. One of the long-standing characters in D.C. was someone I know you heard often. And a guy who was everywhere in early television was Arthur Godfrey. Oh, he wrote the book. I mean, his style of doing commercials. One, I remember, he ran out of time. He says, I got a couple of sponsors I didn't get in. One is Smith Transfer and Storage. The other one is Chambers Funeral Home. Don't make a move without calling Smith's. And if you can't move, 
Call Chambers. <laughs> That's how we got both commercials in. And Walker, in, in the few moments remaining, back to the Joy Boys for a second. I remember hearing this great story about, uh, you use um pop pa music, and they're ad-libbing this commercial for this German restaurant in D.C., and you got a little carried away, and finally the sponsor said, hey, I like it that way. Keep getting carried away during the commercial. Well, we did that. You know, we, we didn't read the commercial. We just ad-libbed them, and we had German background music in there. And we'd say, the old Stein, where the highbrow meets the low and brow, and stuff like that, and uh, stuff like that, you know. But we got a lot of, I guess they're gone now. That shows you what happens to our sponsors. <laughs> well, Godfrey, getting back to Godfrey, I met him one time, and it was in the latter years. He lost his radio show, and he was a rather bitter old man, unfortunately. Uh, and he came in to the station, and I had gone to great lengths to find some of his clips from the early morning radio show and he heard them and we the mics weren't on and we're on the air and he says why the hell did you use those those aren't my best stuff and i i was kind of chagrined i thought they were you know but then when the mind when the mic got on how are you how are you you know it couldn't be nicer well you have to say one thing uh, about arthur godfrey he was a i'm not going to say two-faced he was just a complicated kind of guy yeah and I remember one of the fun things you did during an earlier interview was to show how radio can paint a picture. And you pretended to walk across the room and come back, but you didn't leave. All you did was turn your head away from the microphone. Can you, can you do that again for us, just pretending that you're going to go across the room to get some of your book collection? Yeah, let me, let me show you some of these here. All right. Over here. Back. Now you can take a look at them. Boy, that is amazing. Now you kind of faded out more than you would have in a radio studio because it's a little esoteric here, but you're using a directional microphone. And in the old days, they used those ribbon mics, which picked up everything. But you didn't leave at all. You just turned your head. You did not leave. No, no. Uh, and that's the thing about the radio actors. They could anticipate the sound effects. Like when the Lone Ranger would get on his horse, you don't write into a script, <clears throat> you know, when you jump on a horse. Or when a guy gets shot, you, you, oh, you know, and he falls down, you know. It's amazing. I mean, they, they were consummate actors. They worked hand in glove with the sound man, no question. Ed, it's been a great hour here, and you and I have known each other for a very long time. It's been a thrill to talk to you again and talk about what we both love the most old-time radio. Let me ask you this, though. What would you say to a person who wants to learn about OTR, old-time radio, and secondly, to some young person who decides that he or she wants radio as a career in these days when there isn't much radio anymore? Well, collect the old show. I wouldn't recommend anybody going into to be on the air, quite honestly, unless you're going to be in sales or news. Now, if you're, if you're a journalism major and you can uh, get a job doing radio news and then television news that's where the money is uh the the anchors on the morning and or the evening news on television uh they pay pretty well uh the journeyman announcers don't make that much quite frankly and, and from what i have heard they really never did they never did no and uh they don't have the luxury of picking their own music the music is picked for you and you press a button and the computers play it and you just read the the music sheet so it's not the fun that it used to be. I still love it, and I still enjoy listening to those old radio shows, and I just wish there was, the times would come back when we could do that stuff again. Ed Walker, one of the best-loved announcers on the East Coast, thanks again. This has been great fun. You're more than welcome, Dennis, and I hope you do get back here sometime. Veteran announcer Ed Walker, speaking to us from his home in suburban Washington, D.C., some people may say Ed was born with a disadvantage. I simply say he was born with one heck of a lot of talent. I hope you enjoyed this interview from my new American Montage series. Check out YouTube for more. I'm Dennis Daly. <laughs>